It's in New York. It is 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid live stream series 11, episode 1. That adds up to episode 61. Starts here. Very exciting news this week. A new chapter has begun at the Japanese Stock Exchange, JPX Group in Tokyo, offering all sorts of exciting and interesting new products. Also, actually, very good to see Japan Korea Marker, JKM Futures, coming from Tokom, which is also, of course, now a division of the Unified Japanese Exchange. Elsewhere in Asia, all the very, very best to CME Group's managing director and head of Asia Pacific, Chris Fix, on his retirement after serving CME for the past seven years. Over at Coinbase, wow, all the best of luck to Brian Armstrong and the Coinbase team as they're continuing to deal with the European Union's new law on cryptocurrency. It went through at Kitty Central, I mean the Euro Parliament, just last week. And it was described as anti-innovation, anti-privacy, and anti-law enforcement by the founder of Coinbase and its CEO, Brian Armstrong himself. Meanwhile, on a final note, China has had a regulatory crackdown. There's going to be no more Chang'an Dishi, no more Yin Yang, and five elements are no longer part of the conversation if you're a registered investment advisor or broker in China. Chinese brokers can no longer rely on Feng Shui to provide investment advice. No yogis, that's of course in India, no Feng Shui in China. What's next? Good grief. We'll have to see what's going on in the world of markets with all of these prescriptive regulations. All this and more has already been covered in greater detail in Exchange Invest Daily, the unique newsletter of the Bourse Business. Send us an email or hit me up, Patrick L. Young, on social media, whichever stream you're watching this on. Our show today, we have a fabulous guest coming to us live, Hamish Adurian. He's on the topic of Senara, bringing trading solutions to life. Hamish Adurian is the head of sales and marketing at Senara, a London-based software house established for over 30 years and known as a trusted software provider and partner to leading financial institutions across the world. Hamish joined Sonara in 2006 as a software engineer, building a strong background in the design and development of systems for exchange operations, commodity trading, and market data distribution. Having a keen interest in business, Hamish progressed into sales and marketing, bringing to Sonara's customers his insights into how the financial markets manage to work, and indeed how technology can be used to solve the challenges faced by participants across the financial markets. In 2021, Hamish became responsible for Sonara's sales and marketing operations and continues to champion the Sonara TLC initiative, which has resulted in Sonara investing in a new suite of trading lifecycle components for brokers, exchanges, and clearing houses. Hamish, welcome to IPO Vid. Where in the world are you today? Hi, Patrick. Hi, everyone. I'm in London at the end of Sonara offices. In person, at our own offices. How magnificent! So you're sitting where, just on the on the fringes of the city of London, as I recall correctly, for for your offices. The, yes, down literally down the road from Tower Bridge. You walk outside on on Tower Street, you see the see the famous landmark right there. So yes, that's a, quite a spectacular there. locale to be in, and very very close to the city. And Absolutely. you also benefit from the Jubilee Line and other things are all around you. You've got great transport infrastructure these days. A fabulous mm -hmm. place to be all together. Let me just say a very quick hello. Good evening to Les Calvert. Lovely to see you. Evening all, says Les. Good evening, Les. Great to see you all together. Same time, Marcus Ward. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone mimicking my opening lines. Thank you, Marcus. It's lovely to see you too today. And last but by no means least in this trilogy of early arrivals and commenters, Simon Huckle. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to you too, Simon. I hope all's well in your world and inflation's not treating you too badly in these slightly crazy times. So if you've got a comment or a question you'd like to ask about financial technology, don't forget you can send it to us on any of the different social media by which you're watching this live stream this evening. We're live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube to Hamish Adurian. So Hamish, 
I mean, tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get into technology? Well, gosh, that's going back a fair few years. Now, I, at university, I studied, well, funnily enough, computer science and physics. I always have been interested in, in computing and software engineering and in technology. And I joined Sonara 2006, straight out of university as a software engineer, as you kindly mentioned in your, in your introductory piece. Worked on several projects over the years for different exchanges, brokers, other types of financial institutions, quite large projects. Often, often systems most people don't really see. It sort of makes it hard to talk about what, what it is you, you do for a living. But yeah, gradually, like, over, over time, delivering more and more of these services, getting to know the customers, moved over into, into the business side of things. And now it's like the lead the sales and marketing function at Sonara. And yeah, it's really great to be part of the financial markets industry. There's so much going on. I'm sure we'll be covering lots of things um, this evening ac across the industry. And really, there's such a transformative role that technology has to play right right across the trading life cycle. And just finding where places where we can actually deliver some really interesting new solutions and seeing them come to life and actually be deployed and have people use them, I think is, is really great. And it's, it's a great job to, to have. So it's really interesting because one of those things, I mean, you mentioned is the fact of, of course, the financial markets themselves aren't particularly well known. And a lot of the times the people providing the technology for them are almost invisible outside of a, a relatively small cadre of people. Now, in your good company, Sonara, you've been around for 30 years. You've done incredible things right through the capital market revolution, even from before the capital market revolution was stated. I mean, you predate essentially the Internet age in the, in the early 1990s. Tell us a little bit about the history of the company, please. Yes, Sonara was established in, in 1989. Um, we always like to say we've survived quite a few sessions. I'm sure there'll be a, a few coming in the future. Well, yes, we are throughout our history, we've worked with financial services customers. So that's always been the focus of the business right from the, the early days. We data solutions, so delivery market data integration piece. Um, over the years, market data itself has changed quite a lot, the different types of feeds that have become available. Some challenges remain, and a lot of the early projects were really making it easier to integrate complex market data feeds into, say, a brokerage or an asset manager who need to do portfolio evaluations, for example, and need to get live market data in or end-of-day data for all their various tasks. So there were lots of projects that we did over the years, gradually built up a reputation, began working with um, larger exchange groups, uh, some of our well-known customers such as LSE, LMB, Euronext, uh, working on larger and larger systems uh, over the years. So yes, it's been nearly 30 years where we've delivered a lot of essentially bespoke projects for, for companies right across the financial markets. So that's really, we're brought in where uh, somebody's decided right we need a new piece of software but it's not really something that you can buy off the shelf somewhere or if even if it does exist off the shelf it's not really something that's ready to use for that business it's something that either they think they can get a competitive edge out of it or it's something that's really unique and specialist to the business itself so that's when we'll be brought in often with a bunch of business people thinking, you know, we've got this really great idea, we think we can do things in a different way, take a new service to market, or there's something that just isn't working very efficiently internally, there's a business process that's just too slow, it's keeping the business back, and then we'll be brought in and said, we're told, well, okay, how can you help improve this? Can you deliver a new piece of software that can solve all these problems, take a new service to market? And that's where we'll go in and really have to try and address that tough challenge and often we like to say we were brought in to do some of these hard things but uh, no one else really wants to well it, it's quite incredible because when I mean, you look at that history that has been there for i mean first of all sonara from the time that it was actually born which is absolutely incredible because i mean in 1989 technology really was not there in so many places and we were we were used to very much fixed uh, not fixed gateways, but fixed gateways. You bought your Reuters terminal and it sit and sat in the corner and your other terminals from places like ADP Comtrend and Telerate and all these other companies that no longer are with us didn't interact in any way, shape or form long before we had APIs or any of this exciting stuff, yeah. let alone the whizzy world of the interweb, which came along, what, 
basically, I mean, was only commercially being used within five, six, seven years of the foundation of your company. So it's an incredible journey to, to bring that together. And I mean, I suppose really the thing that interests me, though, is then you look at that history and even your history as you've been going on and you've got this fascinating almost a paradigm i don't want to say paradigm shift but it's interesting to look at the philosophy because essentially i mean technology and markets is it changing the markets or markets are markets changing the technology and i think that's really really fascinating i know you talk about it a lot and i mean just a very very high level what do you think the situation is at the moment are, are, are markets actually reacting to the technology around it or is the technology still being sort of built to fit the markets as they are well i, I hope this isn't a cop-out answer but i think it, it is genuinely both and mm -hmm. in both ways and it, it's a mixed picture as well because different companies in different parts of the market are at different stages of development in terms of the type of technology they have so you will get some companies, you know, be they brokers, exchanges, clearing houses, people on buy side, asset managers, who make some incredible use of, of technology, you know, way ahead of, uh, of other companies, almost sort of ahead, of, ahead of the time, really. So you get that on one extreme, but you will get the other extreme as well, where actually some of the systems may not necessarily have been updated for years. There are still a lot of manual processes in place. And in many cases, they'll be aware of that. that there's a lot of things which are uh, quite high risk, especially in areas of post-trade, for example. As soon as the markets start becoming a lot more volatile, um, they'll be open to, to risk there if not managed properly. So there's a lot of areas where technology development has a long way to go. So it's, not, it's certainly not by any means a uniform picture across the industry. So for us, uh, it's really interesting because we see customers right across that particular spectrum. So we might work, for example, with a financial institution um, that's you know, got, got some really great technology. They may even have their own in-house development team. But actually, they want to do something that's entirely new, a new trading platform, a new mobile app, for example, a new market data service. RFQ platforms, whatever they are, all kinds of different solutions that they want to take to market. But they just need somebody to come in and really bring that to fruition really quickly, you know, using agile technologies, using some of the pre-built solutions that we've developed over the years. You, you mentioned Scenario TLC, for example, at the start. So it's a suite of pre-built solutions that we've been working on for the trade life cycle. So for example, if you're a broker and actually you want to improve your order management solution, then we've got some pre-built components that can help you with that. If you want to improve your market surveillance, for example, and you, know, you, you want to really reduce some of your, your costs um, in that area, there's things we can help you with there as well. So there's that's on the one hand. But then on the other hand, you may have firms where actually they are almost going back to the drawing board and thinking, actually, we need to improve the use of our technology from the very start. They may only have very limited use of, you know, it's, it's a classic, you know, Excel spreadsheets, um, legacy systems that may have been used for many years. And, and you know, generally they've been working okay. So you know, these aren't things that are falling apart, but businesses realize that they need to make investments if they want to stay competitive, if they want to actually grow their customer base, if they want to actually take advantage of some of the inevitable trends um, across the financial markets more generally. I mean, look at what happened at the early stages of COVID, for example. You had a massive spike in retail investors coming on board. And, you know, we can talk about that later. And that's had a huge amount of ramifications for the types of services that many of these companies will want to offer and the expectations as well that um, investors have. If you're used to being able to use a, a nice mobile app to you know, manage your portfolio, are you really going to accept <laughs> a much older application uh, when it comes to doing your professional investing, for example? So there's, um, there's that whole range of, of types of companies that are different stages of development, and we go into all of them and try to help them you know, pull, pull up um, their, their use of technology. And there's all kinds of amazing applications that, that can be developed at every level to try and both improve better solutions to customers ultimately, you know, but also make life easier 
for employees themselves of those institutions, yeah. for traders for compliance uh, officers for management who want to keep track of what's going on. I mean, ultimately, technology, we often forget, it's meant to actually make people's lives easier. <laughs> and if it doesn't, it's not really doing, doing its job. Right? Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because that brings up a whole new aspect, which is related to kind of digital thinking. And I think I'd like to go there in just a second. But first of all, we've got a few excellent comments. So I just want to engage with the audience. Thank you so much. Keep the comments and questions flowing. So absolutely fabulous to to see so much engagement already this evening. I want to say um, hello to Ian Bonsort. It's great to see you this evening. Thank you very much. Hello, Peter Seco. And I hope Ari Zoel as well and your good lady wife. Hello, John T. Good evening, everyone. Great to see you as well and Anthony Clancy saying good evening Patrick Himish and all we appreciate that I'm sure in every possible way now we've got a couple of questions have actually come in all oh, three questions have come in while I've been talking let's go to Simon Huckles made a comment oh about inflation I'm well thanks Patrick inflation will get worse before it gets better in my opinion more worrying is the cost of materials that keeps going up overnight 20 pounds for a scaffold board that was seven pounds 50 before COVID that's actually quite staggering in terms of I mean a th- near 300% rise in the, the course of just a couple of years. Absolutely amazing, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then we've got a question. I'm not sure who it's come from. A LinkedIn user, not showing a name. Ooh, that's a very interesting question, Hamish. Is a particular type of financial institution leading in technology? I think a lot of exchanges in particular have spent, because they have, they've had to invest a lot of efforts, obviously money in performance, being able to handle increasing amounts of trading, millions and millions of orders per second coming in. They've always by necessity, and of course having to transmit the market data as well, again areas where Sonara have done a lot of work over over the years. They've had to always by necessity make those investments. And so they are much more technology oriented, I suppose, than perhaps some other. Um, company. So if you're thinking about who's the Saudi leading and what, what, what we will mention again, any names as such, um, exchanges certainly lead, lead the market in that is, in respect. And also you can think of several exchanges who actually have their own technology arm as well. You know, you've seen that kind of consolidation happening in the market as well, where exchanges are, are building some of their own types of technology and trying to you know, license those out as well. So I think there's there's certainly a lot of that happening and exchanges well on the topic of exchanges the the other area where we've we've come across a particular need there is they're also looking at how they can increase their their market reach reach new types of customers more direct interaction with the buy side i think it's not is a particular trend that exchanges have been looking at over several years now and thinking about how they can create new types of services that the buy side can consume directly, whether it's, for example, new types of data analytics tools, uh, new types of trading services. So that's an area of, of continuous investment uh, as far as many exchanges are concerned. Excellent. That's really, really interesting. Uh, thank you very much. So the, there's a huge mix, but I'm delighted to see as a publisher of Exchange Invest and somebody who builds exchanges all the time that exchanges aren't doing badly in terms of trying to lead the world in the technology that they're using. That's very heartening. Given the fact that actually it has to also be said, I think that when Scenario was first formed, it's fair to say that exchanges were behind the games in terms of what technology was being used by quite a long way. And certainly the mid-1990s, and late 1990s through mid 2000s saw an incredible catch-up yeah. period. Uh, yeah, just yeah we were involved in quite a few projects in, in that early the early notice, early to mid notice when I joined. There were quite a few projects that we were involved in, for example, those early trading solutions, fully electronic trading solutions that more and more exchanges were trying to do. So it's really, it's really interesting to see how that's all developed yep. throughout the years. But I think there's still, still a long way to go, certainly in, in financial markets. To, you were talking about the digitalization and digital thinking. Um, you know, to what extent have we in the markets just been looking at what we've been doing previously and just sort of transplanting that into the digital realm as opposed to thinking entirely digitally from the very start? So, for example, even if you think of something as common as you know, the front office, the back office, the middle office, you know, there's a reason that historically arose. And in a purely digital realm, is that distinction necessarily still there and that's some of the areas that we've been working at with with, with some customers who are trying to break down those silos 
do more integration, get more information in real time, rather than having, you know, a, a trader sees one thing on the front office and you have no idea what's going on in the back office until the end of the day, when all the various end of day processes run. So there's a lot of projects there to try and um, increase that. So, Get, get yes, more, in, get increasing more the more visibility time. through the office is quite considerable in terms of what you can do at all points in time and also therefore help risk management. I mean, it, it's incredible to think that in my career, we used to have people writing stuff on trading cards and you only really knew what everybody's position was every four hours because they had pits. And, and at the end of the day, in terms of overall client levels, whereas now you can do so much in real time. Mm. And that risk management, I mean, if you look at what's been happening over even just the, the last couple of weeks, for example, we saw it through to COVID, that level of market volatility. And you've got to, if, if you're a brokerage and let's say you're, you're keen to expand, you want to make up more customers, well, you've got to be pretty sure that you can you know, do your margin monitoring properly. You can do that intraday. You can react quickly to those sorts of market events. Make sure you can contact your customers in good time. Make sure all those capital flows are, are, are being managed properly as, as smoothly as possible because otherwise if you don't have those in place then you're really risking yourself by trying to bring on all kinds of new customers while not really having or still relying on say an old manual process to try and uh, keep tabs on, on everybody yeah, so, yeah. It, it, it's quite incredible it's quite incredible altogether and, and that actually i mean thank you very much by the way good evening ian miller good evening to you lovely to see you once again on the, on the show thank you thank you so much for joining us we've got an interesting couple of questions actually i mean you mentioned covid several times john t is saying hi how much and how has this investment changed by companies due to the covid effect it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because if you remember what happened back in March 2020, within almost a couple of weeks, you had entire trading floors almost being vacated. But yet everything managed to continue. And you know, all, all these decisions were signed off on remote working and getting the connectivity in place. Decisions that would have taken months or not years or that were being stalled were just signed off. And by and large, things worked and I think that's you know, one of the sort of success stories to, to, to put it that way I suppose what came out of, um, of that period is that the market showed that they could be resilient that they could react to all these things but they were stretched they were absolutely stretched to their limits particularly in post trade in settlement I mean the, in the early days I mean, the clearing houses were absolutely pushed to the limits so clearly resilience was tested and i think that's still you know talking about trends i guess in continued investment in resilience is still absolutely a priority i think across all our, our client base certainly and not just this high technology resilience but resilience in terms of people in terms of processes to make sure that they can really cope with all of these but i think beyond covid um Obviously, on the, uh, in the immediate aftermath, people have had to look at their budgets and consider what, what they want to do. But uh, people realise that, that there are big changes happening in the markets and they have to make investments if they want to be able to keep up with the competition. So while there was a, a bit of a hiatus, certainly this year, I mean, we think that, that's now, we've had also January, we also had a flood of queries coming in for people wanting to, to kick off projects. So I think, yes, maybe while, while there were, may have been a, a bit of a stopgap when people were taking stock of their positions, certainly uh, right across the markets, uh, brokers, exchanges, clearing houses, all three um, are looking to kick off projects again, both internal improvements, get things more efficient, but also deliver entirely new services, apps, websites, um, applications mm -hmm. for, their, for their clients as well. Well, it's very interesting in the whole app economy. At the same time, I have to say, I, I like the comment that's just been offered to us by women on it. It's interesting to see that with all this technology, good old whiteboards are still in vogue. Women on it hack the future. Yes, a very good point. But at the same time, there's nothing better, I think, for actually working out where you are than a very large whiteboard from start to finish. I mean, that's why Google have digitized theirs, haven't they, as, a, as, as an effort. Um, just moving on, Anthony Clancy, thank you very much for your point, woman on it. We look forward to your live stream tomorrow at midday London time at midday CET, uh, EST and uh, 5 p.m. London time. Anthony Clancy is asking which country is developing and leading the software technology in the financial market in your opinion along with solid regulation. Gosh that's three questions in one I think. Have a go. Uh, 
<laughs> well, I think at Sinar, obviously, we, we work with clients in quite a few jurisdictions, um, so the EU, the States, um, Asia. And uh, I suppose it, it's hard for us to sort of pass, pass judgment ultimately on whether they are effective or not, but what obviously we do have a role on is to make sure they can be implemented as, as effectively as possible. Certainly when MIFID came in, MIFID 1, MIFID 2, there was a huge amount of work in making sure that we could actually build systems that would extract the data, report them in, in an accurate way. And I think, to give my perspective on this, I think that a lot of businesses, not necessarily all, but I think the ones who looked at this in a, as positive a way as possible realized actually you could use this as an opportunity to try and get a data system in place that allows you to access as much information out of it as possible. So yes, the immediate goal is to get the data out to the regulator. But actually, why not use some of that data to develop some interesting new products? Why, why not use it to improve your internal analytics, your internal reporting, get some real value out of that? So I think that was a, a kind of a huge side benefit that, that's come out of the, the increasing uh, amount of regulations that have, have been asked for. Um, but in terms of which, which countries necessarily developing and leading it, there's <laughs> we're, we're a great one here in, in, in London, and there's other uh, there's lots of great great companies based in, in, in the UK certainly. We work with other companies uh, across Europe as well. Um, in terms of the the financial markets themselves. Um, our, our immediate prospect space for some of the conversations we're having at the moment so it was right, right across the world. Some really interesting countries you would not necessarily have expected to hear about. So I think there's a lot of investment happening um, across the board in some of the developing markets who are really looking at... Um, I think it's quite interesting there with the developing markets because they're almost jumping several um, leaps ahead. They'll be skipping... Um, several generations of old technology and going straight to some of the, the new and interesting ones that are coming out. So um, I, hope, I hope that was a bit of a half answer based on some of the stuff. I think it's interesting because you, you, you touch on a series of quite fascinating points. Now, I'm going to come back to a couple in a minute, but actually we've got so many questions at the moment. It's absolutely fabulous. So Ian, Ian Miller, he's actually asking a question for me, putting me on the spot, either way, and thank you. Question for Patrick. With building exchanges through the years, have you used Sonara for their expert services to help accelerate the process? Simple answer, yes, we have been involved with a series of different projects at different times where Sonara have been engaged, and I've always found them to be a very, very high quality organization who deliver excellent solutions and they can manage to think out of the box so i hope that helps that answer i can't tell you who it was because i'd have to kill you although at the same time i think that uh, already hamish has alluded to some of the projects around which i may have been involved at different times in the past so that's a that's a fascinating question actually thank you very much ian now Talking of exchanges, lots of people say that market makers use sentiment from Twitter or Telegram groups to manipulate prices in their favor. Is this something retail investors should fear? Mm, I'm not sure that's necessarily a question for you, Hamish, so you don't have to answer that if you're, if you're not up to it. I think what I would certainly say is that exchanges that allow unlimited uh, shorting of stock by market makers perhaps have a tricky issue because then clearly market makers have an incentive to keep shorting that stock. But I don't know if you've got anything to add from the technology side, Hamish. I, I think it's, um, well, there's, there's different angles to it. In terms of the direct answer to the question, it's essentially part of market surveillance and you know, good exchanges will be looking at this and thinking, well, what, what, what can they realistically do to monitor what's going on? in the market to help protect retail investors. And of course, there are more and more retail investors coming on. Um, but also, it, it's an area of um, sentiment analysis has been a, an entire topic in and of itself. And we've done a little bit of work um, you know, constructive way, I, I should add, for some customers who want to look at um, the news stories, for example, and extract, um, say, results um, financial results or certain keywords, for example. So there's lots of good ways, I guess, look, looking from a positive perspective that you can use um, sentiment analysis for. Whether it's actually effective, I, I can't, can't really make, make a judgment call on that, but it, it's something, it is an area of technology that's, that's certainly developed, but sadly, it's all technologies that can be used in different ways. 
But actually, you're hitting a great point, Hamish, because the one good thing about things like social media and so on is that more or less anybody can aggregate that in the comfort of their home, own home. I mean, you, you only need a very basic level of understanding of Python, and you can probably manage to find out a huge amount of information. You may not be nanosecond perfect, but you'll certainly manage to get uh, various interesting pieces of snippets. So I think there's a lot that you can do. Not saying that that's going to be as robust as the sort of industrial solutions that you need in high density, high volume volume, ultra low latency markets, but mm. nonetheless, it's something you can use. Um, and we've got a couple more questions coming in. Gosh, rolling along tight. Hello, Ian Bonsor. Great to hear from you again. Talking of exchanges. Um, oh, no, that's actually the question we just had. I'm so sorry. We just added, I'm in control or out of control. Carl Stone. Hello, Carl. Great to hear from you. Good evening. A one for Hamish. What new in Inter sorry, start again. What new and interesting technologies are you seeing coming through the pipeline? Okay, well, let's sort of start on, on, on that one. Okay, let, let's, I guess, talk about the obvious things. We're probably going to expect when you talk about which is things like blockchain and DLT, digital assets, which I think is probably more than just a, sort of a, a trend or a fad. I think digital assets, certainly in the exchange world, is something that's here to stay. There's a lot of investment going on on that and we'll see more and more diversification in terms of different types of digital assets that can be traded and i think most exchanges will be looking at what, what offerings they can make on that so the whole dlt area digital assets um, is certainly a, an important one the other one of course is cloud um, cloud technology uh, we were seeing more and more certainly of, of our clients across the markets wanting to adopt that particularly for new projects. So a new system would probably immediately go into one of the different cloud providers. So there's more and more of that being adopted. But also different exchanges and brokers as well are looking at what's called lift and shift. So take their existing systems, move it up into the cloud. I mean, that this is an entire conversation in and of itself, how, how we manage that. We've been doing a fair, fair bit of work ourselves in, in um, cloud technology and helping customers with that. But that's certainly an area that's going to keep continuing. So you know, blockchain, cloud, AI is, is the other one. But again, I think it's again more than just the buzzword. There's some really, really interesting things applied in the right way. And AI is basically just really fancy statistics. Let's get that out of the way. It's really, really sophisticated statistics. But applied in the right way on the right data, um, on the right volume of data, you can get some really, really useful information out of that and create some really interesting services. So again, that's something that will continue on. Something else, I think the whole area of hybrid working, I'm not sure the, the ramifications have been fully sort of realized yet, especially in, in, in the capital markets, with more and more, say, traders working from home, how that will impact the types of applications that they will be using. Um, I think that's an interesting trend that we may well see. There'll be different types of, of, of applications that we've perhaps been used to seeing in, in the past. So that, I think that's a, another area which I'm interested to see how, how, will, um, how it will develop. But also, it, it's probably not so much of a technology. Or in, in a way, it's more about development technology. A lot of firms do need to go to market a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. They need to make changes to internal systems quicker. If there's an update to an existing system, it needs to be deployed quicker. People are more and more used to the, these days to apps that just update. You know? it, it just happens. So more of that um, that can be put in place, I think, um, the better. But in, in order to actually do that, you need to adopt the right kind of you know, the project management, whether it's, it's a form of agile, you know, properly managed agile, we can talk about that, to be able to sort of reduce some of those life cycles, reduce some of those um, software cycles and get things to market quicker. And you, know, you may have heard of buzzwords like DevOps, for example, and how we can improve testing, especially with some of the complex products that, that we're building how we can improve that so we can continuously improve quality assurance, improve testing, and get new products onto the market um, quicker. So I think in, in all those areas, really, um, we will certainly be, be working. Well, it's fascinating. I mean, so many things to, to unstring from that. It, it's quite intriguing. I mean, you mentioned DevOps and testing and so on. And obviously, one of the things that's key here in financial markets is that 
we can't have institutional or indeed retail financial applications which spend several years in beta, which was the way that Google managed to build themselves a huge empire, obviously, mm -hmm. because otherwise regulators get terribly, terribly upset and quite understandably so. And, and I think it's fascinating when you talk about DevOps and that whole symbol. Do you think that... I mean, is there a role within that whole ability to bring certain parts of the applications to market faster for things like low code and no code? It's a, in, I've got a standard, my standard answer to the low code, no code thing is that somebody has to build the, the platform on which the, the no code works. And that, that's usually us <laughs> built in to build, to write the code that will support the, support the no code. But I think in, in general, it's really, it depends on, on the system as well, there are some in which yeah, some of those you know, low code, no code systems, um, RPA, so robotic process automation, another trend. Uh, it makes makes good sense, and it may be a, a good way of, of doing things in some areas, certainly. But again, any kind of a new system where there's a, a level of complexity, there's there's nuances, there's different customers who need to use it in different ways. You may have a system where Essentially, you have multiple roles accessing it. You've got you know, one system where you've got the traders accessing it, where you've got compliance officers accessing it, and you've got the client accessing it as well. So you can suddenly see all the different combinations that need to be tested each time that there's a new release. So that's where you know, a, a good DevOps process mm -hmm. can be managed. It's just incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. And therefore, there is undoubtedly some no-code, low-code application that can be used. But it's by the time you've built the massive infrastructure, then you can manage to get things to market much faster in terms of particular things that can be used by a user group, et cetera. And that's the role for that kind of that kind of process. Um, I'm here talking about uh, Sonara, bringing trading solutions to life with Hamish Durian this evening, ladies and gentlemen. We've just got about 20 minutes to go. If you've got a question, ask now, because you never know. The wonderful world of the interweb has a remarkable habit of suddenly managing to throw in a little bit of a delay just when you're asking your most interesting questions. Good question from Liam Moore. Hi, Patrick Himish et al. In respect of the larger or major exchanges worldwide, are these more likely to license a software rather than build their own, especially in regards to potentially adopting cryptocurrencies into the existing exchange? Well, it's there's it is both. I mean, you know, some exchanges uh, to, to address it in a more, in more general way. I mean, many of the, the large exchanges uh, that, that we certainly work with have their own internal development teams. Um, they do a lot of their own software, for example, but they will still bring in companies such as ourselves for certain projects. And you know, there's all kinds of reasons for that. You know, your internal IT team often will be fully stretched. They'll, they will have their own tasks to do, and it's incredibly difficult to then say, Oh, have another, we'll build a new trading platform, a new crypto trading platform on top of that. And this is it's almost a sort of project where it's slightly experimental. It's almost on the fringes of the existing business. And that's where bringing in uh, a, a specialist software house who can just handle that project without sort of touching all, all the other departments, you know, um, messing with, with the budget structure can, can work incredibly well. And you know, certainly we've got our existing Star TLC solution that we can use to bootstrap some of these new trading platforms, a new crypto uh, trading platform, for instance. But ultimately, the decision on whether they license it or not will be a commercial one for them in the longer term. They, some of them prefer to invest in, in, in their own technology so they have ownership of it. So that's often a commercial conversation that we have, whereas others are actually perfectly comfortable with, with licensing a, an existing solution, something that, that we've built, and then they can focus their time and attention on you know, really building up the, the strategic value that only they, they can do. And that's what we always say to our customers, I mean, you guys are, are the trading experts. We are the technology experts. We can provide the software. We can build the trading platform. But ultimately, you are the ones who can you know, build the business, build the um, Build, get the liquidity in place. So we, we can't do that for you. We can provide the um, we can provide the software. So it, it, it's both really, to be honest. And we we, we certainly we've seen a mix of both. But it's an interesting one where um, we, we we often brought in to actually build something from scratch, and then the customer will essentially 
own the IPR of that. Whereas we've, <laughs> we've already built some things internally ourselves. But yeah, that's, that's commercial software development. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, absolutely. But it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. And again, obviously, that time to market question is quite key. Now, we've delved into more regulation here. And I'm not sure you can necessarily ask. I think Peter Sacon has a vested interest here, having been one of the MIFID II experts of Northern England over the course of the last few years. How does MIFID II become MIFID III? What key future changes do you see being introduced going forward? That's a bit off the technology ch channel, but maybe you can offer some thoughts. Um, I mean, I, um, there was some discussion about maybe how reporting could be simplified, and I guess that's, that's always a, a positive. But I, I suspect the way that regulation tends to go is that you know, things should become more and more transparent, and obviously that has benefits in, in, in some areas. Um, there's a lot of OTC trading activity I know that, that regulators were, were have been looking at. But again, from, from, from our perspective, I guess as, as a technology provider, we, we look at these changes and we see, well, what, what are the opportunities for, for our customers, especially when it comes to building a new system. We always want to try and explore, uh, as I was talking about earlier, what are the added benefits that the business can get rather than just seeing it as oh, it's a, it's a cost base, it's just something we need to do. Well, often that is the case. You know, it is something they need to do. Uh, it, it just needs to get done. But it's always interesting to see how, how we can also leverage that to improve some of the technology, improve some of the, the internal transparency, never mind the external transparency, break down some of those internal silos. It's always really interesting when that happens. Very, very, very interesting. I thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for your question. Thank you, Liam Moore, for your question. Really, really welcome. Good to see you on watching the show today. And we're talking about bringing technology to life in the trading world of markets with Sonara and Hamish Adurian this evening. Very, very interesting. I mean, we've mentioned a few times, but how far do you think we really are in terms of thinking digital in financial markets at the moment? I think... As I was talking about earlier, there's, we still have a lot of silos, I think, which is just historically arisen from the way that capital markets, financial markets in general have evolved. And OK, there was a time I think we were talking about, oh, the, the blockchain is the, the absolute future. One day you know, there won't be a need for an exchange. There won't be a need for a clear because all these things will happen on a, on a distributed level on, on the blockchain. I, don't believe that that's really uh, ever going to be a practical vision. But I think there are ways a lot of these businesses will increasingly transform over the years with using technology um, uh, as it grows and evolves. So the more, uh, more of these internal processes that are automated, more T plus zero, I think, should increasingly become the norm. Um, seeing how data, I think data is a really interesting one. There is so much out there that's already locked away, I think, in, in some of these uh, silos, in, in front offices, in back offices around the world. And if they were unlocked using some really interesting algorithms, using some interesting kind of analytics tools, there's some great services that can be, that can be offered. And actually, I think the thought that I'd like to share here is it's actually less, less about technology in a way than about service and people. Because I think the more that we automate things, the more that we digitalize things, the more, the more quickly that you can say complete a trade that would previously have taken three days to do, what that's going to happen is that it's going to increase customer expectations. If all of a sudden you don't need to wait three days to do something and it, it's done in, in one click, in, in in a couple of minutes, all of a sudden people will say, actually, why am I tolerating this really poor service, for, for example? Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how the technology and customer service can actually be used to create that interesting kind of a technology people dynamic. How can we use AI to improve, to extract some really interesting data, but also at the same time, as customer expectations rise, because they're using technology more and more to actually deliver better customer service. So I think that interaction will, will be quite interesting one. Did, you know, I just see you, did I just see you quote me saying blockchain is the future? Oh, no, 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 no. 
<laughs> I'm not sure that you actually said that as we were going on. We'll have a steward's inquiry in a moment where someone someone in production has got very enthused. I think you said it was the future of something. I think we might have left out the sub clause at which point in time you said that it wasn't necessarily the, the future no. of all <laughs> things. I, I think that's quite true. Definitely but not. actually, I mean, it raises a really interesting question, doesn't it? Because you, you've got this situation where... People talk about technology and they say that it's going to revolutionize the business and destroy this and everybody will be swept away. But yet, actually, I mean, having written a book called Capital Market Revolution 20 something years ago, you look back and you think the high street actually looks remarkably the same as it did 20 years ago. There are, there are very, very few big changes in banks. In exchanges, I think the only major... I mean, the major upheaval has been Intercontinental Exchange, who've gone on to buy the New York Stock Exchange, et cetera, and bought a whole series of assets along the way. But really, I mean, the financial firmament looks staggeringly similar to how it was 25 years ago, but with a lot more technology. Hmm. It's interesting. There's been several waves of various startups. So, for example, mm -hmm. when Nifid One came out, we had a whole range of startups across, across Europe, um, for MTFs, for example, and then they all got booked up eventually by, by the more established exchanges. And I, I think we're, you know, it's, it's always a mugs game predicting the future, isn't it? I think we're at the stage where we'll see a lot more of those startups again, um, experimenting with different types of technology. And again, that's the benefit of being a startup, I guess, because you don't have all that legacy baggage. You can try out something uh, entirely new, so I think some of the companies we, we, we've been working with. It, it's uh, fascinating though, isn't it? Because I think at the moment, actually, we don't have any massive regulation changing across certainly the traded market space mm -hmm. as we did. And as you're quite right in saying, I mean, what really defined uh, particularly your early career was it was just wave upon wave upon yeah. wave of regulation, which took us all the way through yeah. until really just just a, just to the point of COVID. And everybody thought, what's going to happen next? And the answer was they all had to work remotely, from which, by the way, I think everybody agrees we had amazing technology because certainly the parish of exchanges operated superbly well during lockdown which was not something that i think a lot of people thought was going to happen yeah. i mean there were there were issues with brokers there were issues at different companies but the actual exchanges have been quite scintillating during covid in terms of what the way they dealt with things and but if you look at how we are going forward now i mean we are in an interesting period of of evolution does that make you more oriented to be working with startup players or will you continue to work with sort of established companies across your portfolio? I think, I think it's almost certainly both. Again, they're, they're very different positions. If you think about our current client base, for example, you have those startups, for example, who are experimenting with you know, entirely new types of trading, new types of apps, um, new types of market data solutions. That's all great at, at the cutting edge. And then you have the established firms who are looking at their internal technology infrastructure. These are the companies, you know, who have been around for decades. They've had solid profitability, but they're now thinking, well, what, what do the next 30 years look like? And that's, it's a different type of project, it's a different type of customer. But that's really looking at internal systems, how they can improve things, make things more efficient, more smoother, rely less on you know, a handful, handful of individuals, use them in a better way, rather than <laughs> having to fill in spreadsheets or do repetitive type. So yes. I think it's definitely, definitely mm. both for, for a company like ourselves who, who work across the financial markets. It, it, has, it has to be, because that's how we also gain, gain experience and gain expertise that we can then sort of cr cross fertilize. And that leads us very elegantly into this question that we just put on screen from Peter Sackham. Thank you once again, Peter. What is the biggest challenge facing technology? I think within the markets themselves, it's, I think COVID, I suppose, um, the, the lockdowns assisted to, to some extent. And that's what's, what's the best way of putting this? It? Almost digi digital um, resistance or something like that, digital sort of digital wall where it's, it's just really, really hard to get new technology in, in place, particularly with some of the really large legacy systems that some of these, these companies have. But that, to some extent, that, that's, that's understandable. If you have a, for example, a, a treasury management system that you've been running for 20 years, and literally the entire business relies on that, 
it might be creaking at the seams. It's, it's data isn't particularly easy to get get out from, but it, it does the job. But at some point, that's it's, it's going to become unmaintainable. At some point, mm -hmm. it may become unsupportable. In some cases, it probably already is unsupportable <laughs> because the company that you originally licensed it from 20 years ago isn't around anymore. Um, so, but it's still difficult. It's, it's hard to sign off on, on those kind of investment decisions. You know, if, if you're a technology executive and you're being asked to sign, make a decision, on that kind of investment, well, of course, it's difficult. And you know, the challenge that companies like ourselves have are really to, to go in there with a with a proposition, with with a solution that can help them through that, to, you know, help that migration from from some of those legacy systems um, into a more more modern, more nimble infrastructure. Where the, the, the fundamental thing is really to make the data accessible. That that's been the fundamental problem with a lot of these systems. The data just you just can't get the data out of it. And if you can't get the data out of it, you're not really using it to its highest value. So yeah, that, that's, that's a challenge, um, but I think we, we can gradually over, overcome that. Fascinating. So, so in relation to, thank you very much, Peter, for that excellent question. I really appreciate your input today once again. So in terms of making that data accessible, I mean, it, it is a fascinating issue across the board. And certainly the, the issue of big, big, big mega data in financial markets has never been greater and the opportunity is huge. So I'm just curious, I mean, where do you think, Hamish, the actual capital market revolution goes next? Um, I think to some extent, I've probably touched on a, a few of those areas, so digital assets, for example, I think that's something that will definitely continue. And I'm curious to see how some of the more established exchanges um, will respond to that. What kind of new assets they will um, they will come up with? And you know, I'm sure we'll be building a few of the systems to to actually underpin the trading. It'll also be interesting to see how the increased participation of retail investors changes the types of applications that um, in the established exchanges create and, and deliver. I talked a bit about the whole area of you know, customer service and how that potentially might improve. Maybe, maybe that's wishful thinking, but I think that's certainly an area. Hybrid working, what the actual ramifications of that are as well. Um, talking about the cloud, I think the move to cloud will, it's, it's been slow, but I think it's going to start accelerating and there'll be more and more solutions that will be shifted uh, to the cloud. I think another interesting area is standards and standardization across the financial markets and to what extent, again, technology can help deliver that. I mean, there's, there's so many things you think about, you know, the codes, different account structures across the, across the industry, which can make interoperability incredibly difficult. So that's an interesting area to see how, how that can be resolved. But you know, that, that has its own it has its own challenges, but technology can help address all those areas. I think lastly, but certainly not re least, mentioned resilience. I mean, that's an area of continued investment uh, where companies will need to look at how they can just keep keep going, essentially, in, in times of high market volatility. And again, that, that's not strictly just about making sure your systems can cope, but also that you have the right people and processes in place to support that. And people, I think, is an interesting one. I mean, you know, what, what ultimately we as a software house, what we need to do is recruit, maintain really talented, smart software engineers, project managers, testers who can, can del ultimately del build and deliver these solutions and support them. So that's the other big area, which is our, our, our support team, support professionals who can actually, over many years often, uh, keep these systems going. It's, it's, it's a truism that we, we spend a lot more time supporting the system than actually developing it in, in, in the first place. So maintaining and recruiting, developing talented IT staff, that's, that's a challenge and it's even more of a challenge now. And that's certainly one area where we keep uh, offering a good value proposition to, to our customers. Well, I think that's absolutely fascinating altogether. I mean, we've got the whole concept of everything from hybrid working and therefore indeed how you manage to manage that talent pool, the possibilities for artificial intelligence, for SaaS, for software in the cloud, for all of the possibilities that are brought to us, whether you're doing a lift and shift or you've managed to build something that's cloud native, the impact that there will be from obviously the digital asset, the blockchain marketplace across the, the world and therefore how that also impacts with the retail investor, which is all 
a multiplicity, a cornucopia of possibilities of how Sonara are bringing trading solutions to life already in the overall world of financial markets. And it's certainly very, very interesting to hear you saying about data standards. I think that's something that's very, very interesting because certainly there's a scary possibility that that may be implemented by the sort of clod hopping regulators who actually don't have this first single clue of what they're doing. But your point is well made, actually, because as you say, Hamish, what you're actually going to be spending on the development of a system is probably going to be matched or indeed exceeded by the costs of running that system over a series of years thereafter. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have been bringing trading solutions to life with the fabulous Hamish Adurian of Sonara, one of those really, really interesting companies that are sitting there behind zillions of trades and transactions that we investors are doing every day, but are never actually known or seen by the general public. And I think actually it would have to be said probably from Sonara, you don't want to be seen or known to the general public in that respect, because if it was, it would mean something's gone wrong. So the fact that you haven't ever heard the name Scenario, various Scenario, various of our listeners today and viewers is precisely because of their success in terms of what they've achieved over time. Apologies to Anthony Clancy. We didn't quite get time for your question today. Thank you very much, though, for your other questions. Thank you, too, to Les Calvert, to Marcus Ward, Simon Huckle, Ian Bonsor, and thank you for your questions, Peter Secon. John T, good to hear from you. Anthony Clancy, as I say, sorry we didn't get to your last question there. We were delighted to see LinkedIn user, whoever that was, lurking behind the anonymity facade within their big data environment. John T, Ian Miller, woman on it, Carl Strong, and Carl Stone, sorry, Liam Moore, and indeed, it only remains for me to say a big thank you to our production team today, Racy, Jamil, Mary, and Beata. You've done a fabulous job, as always, bringing this together, where I'm sitting in the Caribbean and across the world. Thank you very, very much for your kind comments, and John T. It's been another super successful conversation in the lineup of the discussions of our overall History of brilliant discussions. Number 61 is more or less at an end. We're just waiting to see. Next week, we'll be back, but we're having a little difficulty. It seems bringing you that board. We're going to have another fascinating guest for you in a week's time. Only remains for me to say thank you very, very much, Hamish Adurian. It's been a super show all together. Wishing you thank and you Sonara all the very, very best for the future. My name is Patrick L. Young, and we are looking forward to seeing you next week. When we've got a highly special guest, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Patrick Young. And no, it's not me. Tune in next week for what is going to be a singularly unique Patrick Young with Patrick Young discussion on IPO Vid. My name is Patrick L. Young. Thank you very much for watching the show today. I wish you all a great week in life, blockchain and markets. Thanks again, Hamish Adurian. Sonara, bringing trading solutions to life. We'll be back in Exchange Investor in the course of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching.